such an awesome God is he and you think of who he is in your life who he is as Lord over the universe it elicits a praise and an adoration that does not belong to man but only to God because he is worthy and so worthy to be praised and we we love him and honor him and adore him so much for being such an awesome awesome God to us well I pray that the strength of God is forever realized in your heart no matter what you face that you will know on the inside way deep down that God is greater no matter what you deal with, God is greater. He's greater than every trial, every struggle, every difficulty in your life, every sickness. He's greater than every pain that you feel. God is greater. Whatever you're dealing with right now, God is greater. He's greater. And there is an other side of whatever you're in right now that you're coming through it. The Lord is with you. He's a faithful deliverer. The God who hath delivered and doth deliver and yet shall deliver. I'm just glad that the Lord our God is such an awesome, awesome deliverer. He's still working in an incredible way in the lives of his people. And we are just blessed to have such a father who takes care of his children the way that he does. He arranges and rearranges and God knows how to dispose of stuff that's been exposed. He's a faithful God faithful faithful in all of his dealings with us and we celebrate him and and honor the king of kings and the lord of lords one of you are turning your bibles with us acts chapter 24 acts chapter 24 we're getting down toward the end of the book now and i'm talking in this particular chapter about handling a fiery trial handling a fiery trial i'm going to give you some keys on being able to handle fiery trials in your life if you're dealing with with something there's a there are particular ways of being able to handle the fiery trial well paul is in in one of these fiery trials he's in hot water if there's ever been a trouble a time for paul's life he's in it right now uh, the previous chapter talked about his being before the sanhedrin court and now he, which is this, the Sanhedrin court was not a real court because they could only deal with religious things that pertain to the temple. But now they are, they're brought into the legal system now. It's almost like at first, you know, you're dealing with something that's been structured by the church, but now you come into a, an actual civil suit. And so he's, he's, in, he's in the civil court now uh, dealing with uh, some, some real issues. He's been taken before the governor. Uh, Governor Felix down here in Rome. So beginning here in Acts chapter 24, let's look at the first few verses here. Now after five days, Ananias the high priest came down with the elders and a certain orator named uh, Tertullus. And these gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And uh, when he called upon Tertullus, uh, when he called upon, Tertullus began his accusation saying, seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight. We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. He's buttering him up, buttering him up. You have to always watch people. In encouragement, respects, flattery, expects. He's flattering the man because he's expecting something. He wants events to be turned in his favor, so he butters him up through flattery. Well, you have to be careful when people start flattering you because they expect something for you, from you. So don't get too excited when folks start flattering you. You better ask, is this really genuine or is this flattery? And so notice here, nevertheless, he said, verse 4, uh, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you, here comes what he wants. I beg you to hear, by your courtesy, a few words from us. Uh, we have found this man a plague, a, a creator of dissension among the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. Isn't this amazing? Now he's, he's, he's coming, and, and Paul is not even present right at the moment to defend himself. They're sort of having a little private meeting 
to try to uh, taint his view. Paul here has had to defend himself in public five separate times during the two years that he was in Jerusalem and Caesarea. And uh, you really cannot count Paul's appearance before the Sanhedrin court as a legitimate trial. So this event here that he's having with Felix can be really considered as Paul's first real trial. His first real trial. Now Paul deals with three frustrating things during this trial. And oftentimes you'll find yourself dealing with these same three things whenever you have a trial. You'll have a trial. A trial comes into your life, you deal with these three things. Number one, accusation. Accusation. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. It's always bringing up some accusation against you. Uh, saying what you did, who you owed, and what you took, and, and what you meant, and how you looked at somebody. Always accusing. Always accusing. People, you can have a certain look in somebody say, uh-huh, yes, yeah, look, you can tell she had da daggers in her eyes. Somebody will say, so-and-so looked in my face and didn't even speak. Maybe they didn't even see you. Something else might have been on their mind. And now you have been out of shape because somebody didn't speak to you. you they didn't even see you. They don't even know you like that. You'd be surprised how accusation can come. Satan is an accuser of the brethren, is an accuser of the brethren. May, may I just tell you that, and you know, some people talk about how long distance relationships don't work. It, uh, relationships don't have anything to do with whether they work by distance. It is not distance that destroys relationships, it's doubts. It's when the person starts saying, well, I wonder what so-and-so, you know why? Because an accuser has whispered into their ear. They're probably not being faithful to you. You don't know who they with. They don't know who you with. You don't know what they're doing. Accuser, accusing the person. And you're not even there. He's dealing with accusation. Satan is the accuser of the brethren, always accusing you. He'll tempt you into something and then point the finger of accusation to you. It's amazing. So. Paul right now is dealing with accusation by these folks from the Sanhedrin court. I mean, Ananias, the high priest himself, is accusing Paul, the apostle. And secondly, he's dealing with argumentation. Argumentation. So when, whenever you, you, you argue a, a, a case before a court, you argue the case. This is Paul's defense. Paul has to give a defense for himself. He's fighting for his life. He's having to state the case. He's having to correct things. He's having to clarify things because this is an argument. If somebody gives an accusation against you, you have to try to come up with an argument to say, no, what you're saying is not true. Now here, here's my side. So there's argumentation. There's an accusation. Anytime you're accused of a crime, that's, a, that's the accusation. Now you've got the argumentation to say, listen, you said that I wasn't doing anything. That's not true. Let me show you what I've been doing. Or you said that I did this. Let me show you. Here's what I was really doing. And so it's argumentation. Then the third thing that Paul dealt with was procrastination. Procrastination. You ever been waiting on a deal, a brick come through for you? You ever been waiting on, uh, to, to hear news as to whether or not you were accepted into the program, into the school, whether your loan was approved or not, whether you got the job or not? You ever apply for something and you're just waiting and they just procrastinate there? Like, you know, you, you turned in the application, you, you did everything that they wanted to do and then you're just waiting around. You don't know when they're going to call you, if they're going to call you. And you have to sometimes call them back, email them back, do something just to let them know, hello. I'm still here. You ever, ever notice what, what happens whenever you're in a trial that's always this, this uh, procrastination period? And, and, and it, it, it draws people out and, and that's the most anxious time when you're dealing with procrastination. When you're waiting on some uh, form that has to be approved by the government for them to send you your, your paperwork back. And you got somebody in the, in the office giving you the runaround with bureaucratic red tape. 
and it's procrastination and it is so incredibly frustrating because you don't know the outcome and you're waiting Paul is dealing with all of these things accusation argumentation and procrastination he's trying to have a trial here and he's accused by these uh, Jewish folks that he's upset and now he's trying to argue his his defense before Felix uh, the governor and then the governor delays the decision it, it, you, you'll notice that he, he delayed it for two years but procrastination will drive you up a wall just trying to wait on on, on something to happen it's uh, procrastination is oftentimes a certain form of cowardice a certain form of cowardice because we have a tendency to procrastinate about things that you really don't want to do and procrastinating makes easy things hard and it makes hard things harder procrastinating it makes easy things hard and hard things harder I mean think about it if you don't wash a dish out immediately after you use it while it's easy to clean it makes cleaning that thing that was that was easy to clean procrastinating makes it hard to clean and and so uh, there's certain thing that ought to be tackled I mean procrastination now now you enjoy it while you're procrastinating but it's just like charging stuff on a credit card you enjoy it while you're charging until you get the bill <laughs> and, and see then that's when this anxiety sets in and so Paul is dealing with three main accusations here. There are three accusations that were brought against Paul. I want to notice, notice here the first one here in verse 5. He says, for we have found this man a plague. And they meant by that a troublemaker, a creator of dissension among the Jews throughout the world. Now they really are exaggerating this thing about Paul. And that's when you know this is the devil, that he, he takes something and, and he, he has this ability to magnify little stuff blow it up and make it bigger than what it really is and we have found this man a plague a creator of dissension among the Jews throughout the world throughout the world and they're just really blowing it all out of proportion and now Paul defends himself Paul doesn't just let them just just say whatever he wanted to say now Paul is a New Testament Christian Paul has a Holy Ghost Paul said I thank my God that I speak in tongues more than y'all I don't know who ever told Christians that Christians ought to just lay down and let people walk over you and tell lies over you. You stand up, speak the truth, lay down the law, you know, correct the story, clarify. Now if the Lord tells you to hold your peace and let him fight your battle, obey the Lord. But if somebody has accused you and the Lord gives you the, the, the clarity of mind to be able to give a response to it, then do it. Here's what Paul's doing. He, he doesn't, he's not convicted of the Holy Ghost. He's not being restrained. He doesn't come under guilt. Notice Paul gives a response to that in verse 11 down through 13. Notice what he says. Because you may ascertain that it is no more than 12 days uh, since I went up to Jerusalem to worship and neither, they, they neither found, in, uh, found me in the temple disputing with anyone nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. Paul had witnesses that just 12 days prior he was in the temple obeying a custom of the Jews going through a purification rite. Paul was going through it respecting it quietly in the in the temple obeying the rules of the Jewish culture showing his loyalty to Judaism and there were witnesses so Paul knew that he's like now what these folks are saying is not true he says listen 12 days ago I was just there now they're talking about me causing trouble every place I was just in the temple there 12 days ago and there was no disturbance and then here comes the second accusation it's also in verse 5 Paul is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes that he's a ringleader now remember that during this this time the term Christian at this time was only used for Gentile believers Gentile believers and perhaps uh, it was only a term of ridicule even for them 
But the, the legal tactic that Tertullus was using here was he was trying to cast the Nazarenes into the mold of a political movement so that Felix, the governor, might see them as a, as a danger to the public welfare. You see, remember they're in a civic thing now and Felix is a governor, he can't really convict him over some religious stuff. It's got to have reference to the society of their creating disorder in the society and, and uh, inciting uh, unrest. And, and so Paul has to, has to respond to this second accusation, which he does in verse 14. Here's what Paul says. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. So he, he tells them that in verse 14, he gives them that, that, uh, that discourse. And remember, Paul had already had this, this, this argument, this discussion, and Gallio had already concluded in Corinth that the way was not a political party, but rather it was a fulfillment of Judaism itself in which it was firmly rooted. And so they had already made a, a, a judgment on it and they said it, this is not a political movement, a political party or anything of this nature. This thing is a part of Judaism and therefore it was legitimized in their eyes as not a cult or some, something that was peculiar that it was a part, a legitimate part of Judaism. And then here comes the third accusation. In, in verse 6, they said he even tried to profane the temple. Now Paul was a devout Jew. He knew Jewish law. Paul was a Jew of Jews, fluent in five different languages. He, was, he understood the law. Paul used to persecute people who were Christians. So he was a Jew among Jews. And now they're talking about Paul profaning the temple. Paul never would have done so. See, the Romans had given the Jews jurisdiction of internal affairs in their temple. And so if they could prove that Paul had tried to desecrate the temple, then Paul would have been in very, very serious trouble. But they couldn't prove it. And Paul responds to this third accusation here in verses 17 through 19. And notice this. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, going through those purification rites, neither with a mob nor with tumult. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me. And so, Paul is defending himself. He's saying, this is what they said in the accusation. And Paul is saying, this is the truth. This is what happened. And I want you to know that the upshot of the whole trial was not a, a hung jury. It was a hung governor, so to speak. Because he had no legal grounds on which to stand to accuse Paul. But at the same time, he didn't want to offend the Jews. And so he postponed, he procrastinated by postponing the final decision instead of releasing Paul as he should have done. He held on and made him sit in jail for two years. Notice verse 27. But after two years, Porcius Festus succeeded Felix. And Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound wanting to do the Jews a favor, political favor. Here's his, here are these political games. I hope you see that didn't just start in our lifetime. Politicking has been going on a long time. And they weren't doing it because it was the right thing to do, because it was not the right thing to do. And so the things that we see now, this is not the first time that we see that justice in many instances is perverted and politically motivated. And so they dealt with it in the times of Jesus. As you see, Paul is dealing with this. Now this is Paul in his trial before Governor Felix. But now what do you do when you're in your fiery trial? 
See, that's the question. These things are written for our example. What do you do in your fiery trial? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> do you realize that you don't even have a trial with people unless people for some reason don't like you? Have you ever noticed that? You don't get in big trials with people who are crazy about you. Folks that are crazy about you don't take you to court. I mean, whether, I don't know whether you've noticed that or not, but they're, they're not the folks that cause you the greatest trouble, the people who are crazy about you. You know, if a grandparent is crazy about their grandchild, the last person to harm that grandchild will be the grandparent because they're crazy about them. You don't have to worry about people who like you doing you harm. You do have to worry about people who pretend to like you doing you harm. You really do. And uh, over the course of my life, the, the, you know, the few, the short 29 years that I've been here. <laughs> I realize that there are about three basic reasons that people don't like you. You're curious to know what those are? That's not enough people who sound like they want to hear it. What about those of you who are streaming tonight? Do, do, do you want to know? I can't hear you. <laughs> Number one, I find that one of the main reasons that people don't like you is because they don't like themselves. Do you know happy people don't waste their time hating on other folks? If you got stuff going on in your life, you don't have time to be just hating on other people. The people that, that hate on you, you know, something's wrong with them. You know, miserable people like to make other folks miserable because misery loves my God, you all are prophetic. How did you know that? <laughs> but people don't like you because they don't like themselves. You ever find mean, ornery people who just, you know, run everybody away? They don't like themselves. They, I mean, the old grouch, Scrooge, he, he didn't like himself. And so he, he made sure that he didn't like anybody else. It was really a reflection. We treat other people the way that we see ourselves. And there are some people that are mean and ornery and, 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 and when you deal with them, don't, don't even waste your time arguing with a person who doesn't like you because they really don't like themselves because there's nothing that you can say to win the argument because the argument is not with you. The argument is something in them that they don't like. It's not even about you. They were like that when they met you. They had those issues and those problems before you ever came into their life. And now they are manifesting to you a reflection of who they are. People will tell you who they are by, by how they treat you. They really will. People that love themselves are kind toward other people. People that will cuss you out at a drop of a hat. You don't have to wonder how they really feel about, about you. The perfectionists who are always finding something wrong with everything that another person does, guess what? They don't know how to turn that off. It also comes on them. They, they say, why did I do that with my stupid self? They kick themselves all the time. They, they look at their own work and criticize themselves and condemn themselves and they do it to others. You can't love other people in a way that's greater than what you are able to love yourself. And so people don't like you because they don't like themselves. That's one reason, not the only reason. Touch your neighbor says, not the only reason. <laughs> then there's some people that just don't like you because number two, they see you as a threat. They see you as a threat. Now this person, they're, gonna t they're trying to take my job. And God forbid this one, they're trying to take my husband. <laughs> they want my wife you know I mean whatever the issue is they see you as a threat 
They see you as a threat. That's, that's why some folks won't even like you. It's like, mm, mm, look at Miss Thing. <laughs> now look what just walked in. Look who coming in and put in the application. And they see her walking, bam, boom, bam. <laughs> <laughs> and some folks they don't even know anything about her she can be the sweetest person but immediately they see how other eyes are on her and now immediately they feel threatened by her they feel threatened by her touch your neighbor say I know this person <laughs> sometimes you'll be going through a fiery trial and trying to figure out why are they hating on me like this? You can go on a job and it's just because you are sharp and because you've done your homework and because you know your stuff and they're threatened by you because you do your work with excellence and in a timely fashion and you're professional, you show up shabbiness. And they are threatened by your professionalism and what you do. It's amazing. I mean, so, I mean, sometimes people are threatened not, not necessarily by your looks but sometimes by your skill. I can't tell you, sometimes it's your credentials, where you came from, what's on your resume, and, and there'll be things, and folks are, are, are threatened because of something, and sometimes we're not even aware of what it is about us that's threatening somebody else. And they'll be summing you up and, and making accusations against you. And you're trying to defend yourself, and you don't even realize that people are negatively judging you because it's like, I just showed up. And you got a fiery trial that's going on. You are on trial. I'm going to give a 30 day, 30 days. <laughs> she ain't going to last 30 days in here. The reason people don't like you is because they don't like themselves. Number two, the reason they don't like you is because they see you as a threat. And number three, the reason they don't like you is it cause, it's because they want to be you. It's amazing. They, they, in some strange way, they are jealous of you. They're jealous of what you have, or should I say who you have. You, you don't ever know. Sometimes people start criticizing a person. Huh, look at her, her, teeth, her, her teeth are cricket. I don't even know what he want with her. <laughs> she saw something in him that you may not see. And so sometimes folks will be hating on you just because they want to be you. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Join us again next time for Power for Living, where revelation is power, power for living.